Okay, so I am making this video in a slightly different way, uh, only because my pen thingy isn't working. So I ordered a new one, but I need to get to this video about how to work on the problem set in the meantime. Um, <clears throat> so unfortunately, you're going to just have to listen to my voice, and I really won't be able to um, draw things out that much. But like I did for problem set number one, I'm just going to walk you through each of the questions and give you the strategy um, and even kind of start it for you. Um, again, my goal is you're obviously going to watch the video and that's going to help you do the problem set. But at the end of the day, my goal is that you learn the material. Your goal, for many of you, yeah, you want to learn the material, but also you want to do well in this course. So I want to give you a safe environment to learn the material. Okay, so let's start with number one here. <clears throat> so for the firm, the firm, when it's producing something, it needs to be concerned about um, how does it minimize its costs in producing an item. So remember, it has two things that it can um, use, at least, to uh, produce something. That would be labor and capital. So um, much like we did for consumer choice, we need to set up a ratio. The ratio here is going to be how much does um, labor cost versus its marginal productivity, how much do machines cost versus their marginal productivity? And we set that ratio equal to each other. And if we cross multiply, then essentially what we should get is that the marginal productivity of labor would be in the numerator. And it would be over the price of labor, which is essentially the wage rate, equal to the marginal productivity of capital over the price of capital. Now you'll notice that that equation is set up very um, identical, <laughs> quite identical to how we set it up for um, how we set it up for a consumer. Now you may have missed this little part of the um, line here, but it turned out to be very important in solving this in any combination. So we're saying here a chair takes four hours of labor or machinery in any combination. So what that means is that we are dealing with a isoquant, which is uh, linear, meaning that labor and capital are perfectly substitutable for one another. What that means here is that we can set the ISO cost line slope. So the slope of the ISO cost is going they're downward sloping, so it's negative, and it's going to be the wage rate over the rental rate, which in this case is negative 30 over 15, which is essentially negative 2. That negative 2 serves again as our slope of the ISO cost. Now what about the slope of the ISO quant? How much of a chair can I produce? So here's the question. How much of a chair can I produce if I have only one hour of labor? 0.25, right? Because it would take four hours of labor to make a chair. How many chairs could I make if I had one hour of machine? Same thing, 0.25. So the marginal productivity of labor over the marginal productivity of capital is 0.25 of a chair over 0.25 of a chair, which essentially is negative one. And that would be the slope of my ISO quant. And therein lies the problem. Because as you start to answer the later parts, the latter parts of this, we just I just described an ISO cost line that has a slope of negative two, and I described an ISO quant which has a slope of negative one. 
which graphically, unfortunately I can't show it to you, but graphically it creates a corner solution. A corner solution is one where there's no point where the ISO cost line is equal to the slope of the ISO quant line. So in essence, because they are never equal, then you're going to pick a, a your, the corner solution is going to be that you direct everything towards machines because machines are the cheapest, right? And, <laughs> and if labor and capital are equally productive, then you'll just crowd into machines. So the best you can do is zero workers, four hours of machine, and even that is not good enough. And so hopefully that should give you enough information to solve number one. And again, my apologies. This is not an exactly an ideal way to uh, go through this problem set, but um, the due date is really coming up. I can't delay it because it's only a six-week class, and we can't really wait for Amazon to ship the item. So I am sorry. Um, I am sorry. But... Um, I'll try to help you as best I can here. Okay. How do I show you this one for number two? Okay, so for number two, we have the economy taking a downturn and the labor costs are going to fall by 50%. And I basically want you to show me what happens um, to the expansion path after the wage falls. Well, essentially what you would draw here is you would draw a series of isoquants. So the isoquants, those will just be convex towards the origin. And so just draw a series of those. Then draw a ISO cost line. And if the wages are falling by 50%, if you put labor on the X axis, then the ISO cost line is going to get flatter. Which is going to push your expansion path downwards if you start to look at where your expansion paths would be. And so hopefully for number two, that's the kind of graph that you will show. Uh, number three. So I give you both firms, uh, disk and floppy. I give you their production functions. And I basically ask you in part A, if they both use the same amounts of capital and labor, which would generate more output? Then essentially, you know that there will be a difference. And you know that there'll be a difference because as you take the marginal productivity of capital and labor, as you solve for this, it's going to create a different marginal productivity of labor and a marginal productivity of capital. Um, Let's see here. How do I want to, how can I talk about this instead of drawing something out? Um, if they're going to use the same amounts of capital and labor and the if they're going to use the same amount of total capital and labor, but the amount of capital is not going to be equal to the amount of labor, and we're not going to equally divide it. So the firm will have to have more capital than labor or more labor than capital. Then as long as the capital is greater than the labor, 
floppy will make more. Why do we know this to be the case? Because its marginal productivity of capital is greater than the marginal productivity of labor for the same firm, but also its marginal productivity of capital is greater than the marginal productivity of capital for disk. So as long as both companies have the same amount of total labor and capital, but the total labor and capital within the firm is not equally divided, if the situation is one where capital is greater than labor, then floppy will make more. The math tells us why that must be the case. Now, what happens if the capital is going to be at nine machine units? Which one is going to generate more? Now, If the capital is nine, then for disk, it would be 10 times nine to the 0.5th power, L to the 0.5th power. Taking something to the 0.5th power is the same as taking the square root. So what is the square root of nine? three. So that's the k to the point five, which is nine to the point five, simplifies to three. So 10 times three is 30. So for disk, if it has nine units of capital, its production function is going to be q equals 30 square root of l or l to the point five. So it'd be 30 l to the point five. For floppy, now this one's a little bit um, clunkier because now I'm taking 10 times 9 to the 0.6. Use a calculator. Um, I did. And, um, you know, I just tried to round to two significant digits. And I got 37.37. .37. So in your calculator, you would be typing in 9 and then that little upside down caret symbol and then taking that times 0 0.6 um, and multiply that by 10. So that gives you 37.37 L to the 0.4. Which one of these two companies has a greater marginal productivity of capital? If you look at those two companies, I've got L to the 0.5 versus L to the 0.4. So my marginal productivity of labor is going to be greater for disk than it is for floppy. Again, I'm just trying to get you through the problem set. The answer key is going to make things probably a little bit clear because it'll be drawn out actually. Okay, isn't this fun? Okay, number four. So I give you the wage rate, that's three. I give you the rental rate of capital, that's two. I give you the production function, 10KL. And then I say, what is the least cost way of producing 60 units of output? And then what would be the least cost me of way of making 240 units? Okay. So what's the slope of the ISO cost? That would be three over two, negative three over two, right? The price of labor over the price of capital. So three over two, and it's negative because it's downward sloping. So negative three over two. What is the MPL? The MPL is um, uh, what did I? Yeah, um, the the MPL 
is 10K. The MPK is 10L. Again, to remind yourself for the exponent rule, there's a, a 1 as the exponent here. So that's why it's either just 10K as the marginal productivity of labor and the marginal productivity of capital is 10L. So now with that given, what is my slope of my ISO quant? Well, that would be 10K over 10L, which can be reduced as K over L. Now, set the slope of the ISO cost equal to the slope of the ISO quant. The slope of the ISO cost, as we just said, is negative 3 over 2. The slope of the ISO quant is negative K over L. Cross multiply and you get 2K equals 3L. Divide each side by 2 and you get K equals 1.5L or 3 over 2L. And essentially, now, all that we need to do is solve this for a production function that's equal to 60 and then 1 for 240. And then here's where I won't solve all of it for you, but here's what we know, right? We just found that the optimal ratio of capital to labor is capital K equals 1.5L, right, or 3.5L. So K equals 1.5L. What I want you to do is I want you to set this up where it's 60, right here for the Q, equals 10 times 1.5L, substituting that in for the K, 1.5L, and then L. Which would essentially be 60 equals 15 L squared. Divide each side by 15, and you get 4 equals L squared. Take the square root of both sides, and you get L equals 2. If L is equal to 2, then K has to be equal to 3, because we already said that k equals 1.5L. Repeat those steps and you should be able to do it for um, q equals 240. Number five. <clears throat> and again, I, I'll say this with each one I seem to be doing here. I know I'm making this one a little bit tougher for you because I can't use my little pen on the screen here. So you're kind of listening to what I'm saying. And I do hope that it's, help, it's helping you do this. Okay, so now we have a production function, which is Q equals 10 LG. The G, we kind of took out the capital here and we're just using kind of the raw input glass. It doesn't really change anything. It just basically changes the variable. So don't get all weirded out by there being a G instead of a... L, or sorry, uh, a G instead of a K. So what's the marginal productivity of labor and the marginal productivity of glass? Same steps here. MPL would simply be 10G. MPG would simply be 10L. Cross out the 10 on both sides, and basically the slope of your isoquant would be G over L. That G over L, which is your answer for letter A, in letter B, you're going to set up that ratio of G over L equal to the price of labor over the price of glass, which in this case is 4 over 4. And if that's the case, then 4G equals 4L, which basically means G equals L. Um, 
with G equaling L, you're basically doing what you did for number four and you're repeating that here. So now you're gonna take your 90 and put it in for your quantity here and it's gonna equal 10 and then simply substitute right either G for L or L for G so that you can get rid of one of the unknowns so that you're just solving for one unknown. And so you should be able to solve for how many units of labor and capital we would want for um, producing 90 units. If your labor and glass are not the same number, then you did some math error somewhere. And then in letter C, you would resolve this again. So now what you need to do is instead of doing 90 as your Q, you're going to take 160 as your Q. And to know what kind of returns to scale we have, what we need to do, what you would need to do is look at how much are you changing your labor in glass by? Are you changing your labor in glass? So to go from, sorry, what are we doing here? To go from 90 to 160, I don't know what percent change that is. Um, I wouldn't know. Um, to go from 90 to 60, it's less than 100% change, but um, I don't know what it is. The reason why you're doing this, though, is because you want to look at how much labor and glass additional amount you need. If you need them by the exact same percent, so let's say that it's 80%. If you get an 80% increase in output, but you had to use 80% more inputs, then you would have constant returns to scale. You'd have increasing returns to scale if it took you less than 80% of an additional input to get 80% output. And you would have decreasing returns to scale if it took you more than 80% increase in inputs to get an 80% increase in output. I'm just making up the 80% number here. I'm not, I don't know that that's the answer. I don't know what the percent is to go from 90 to 160. Oh. Um, I feel so lazy when I take that. Uh, 77.77%. That wasn't too far off. Okay, so that's my increase in output. 77.77%. Thanks, coolversion.com. Oh, sorry, coolconversion.com, not cool version, coolconversion.com. Um, what you would now just need to do is solve for what's the percentage increase in the inputs you need. If it's less than 77.77%, it's increasing. If it's greater than 77.7%, 7%, it's decreasing returns to scale. And if it's exactly equal to 77.77, then it's constant returns to scale. Okay. <coughs> Let's look at number six. So, uh, total cost equals 200 plus 55Q. What is the fixed cost in letter A? Well, that's going to be your cost that's not changing with your output. So, in that function, what is not changing with output? The 200. If the company is making 100,000 units, what is its average variable cost? So where's the variable cost component? It's right here, 55 times Q. So you'd multiply, you would put in 100,000 for Q, and you'd multiply that by 55, and divide 55 times 100,000, divide it by 100,000. That's going to be your average variable cost, which is 55. <laughs> Um, what's your marginal cost per unit? Marginal cost, remember, is a question of how much does your cost go up each time you add an additional quantity. 
It turns out in this case to also be 55. And then for your average fixed cost, the equation there would be your 200, and you're going to divide that by your quantity. We don't have a set amount of quantity in letter D, so it's just going to be 200 over Q. I know I kind of basically told you the answer for all these parts here, but um, the hope would be that if you, when you see something like this on the exam, you're going to be prepared for it. Because you're also going to get the problem set answer key after you do the problem set, and you'll see it written out. Okay, and then let's look at, yeah, this is the last one here. So in number seven, we have a production function here. Q equals 5KL. So what you're going to need to do, um, I'll leave this one a little bit more challenging. i get you most of the way here and um, give you a little bit of a challenge. Remember, there's not, as long as you're spending the time on this, you're, you're not going to be um, harmed too much in terms of grade. Um, for doing your best, basically. <clears throat> so the first thing you would need to do is find your marginal productivity of labor and your marginal productivity of capital. So I'm not going to give you, I'm not going to tell you directly like I have done for all the others. I'll have you do that. So find the MPL and the MPK using this production function. And then... There's one key way that this becomes a little bit challenging. And that is that I tell you right here, and you may have missed it when you read the question, that they always have to use five machines. So what that means is that you're going to solve the MPL and you're going to solve the MPK. But what you're going to do is put that 5 in for k right here, which means q is going to equal 25L. Or L will equal q over 25. Let's use that information to start to solve for things. So in letter A, if we're trying to find the cost function for the plant, you're going to have to set up a total cost function. The total cost function is going to be what? 5 times 10,000, 50,000, that's my fixed cost. That's just the way things are. So remember, a total cost function has a fixed cost component and a variable cost component. So your total costs are going to equal 50,000 plus 5,000 times L plus 2,000 Q because you need 2,000 in raw materials per engine. So my total cost function is going to be 50,000 plus 5,000 L plus 2,000 Q. From that, you should be able to solve for the average cost and the marginal cost um, with that information. Um, the way you're going to be able to do that, so let me repeat again what we have here. We have 50,000 plus 5,000 L plus 2,000 Q. The problem you've got is that you've got two unknowns. So you need to get out, you need to get rid of one of those unknowns. And you can get rid of the L. Because as I said maybe about a minute or two ago, probably two minutes ago, is that the L equals Q over 25, right? That was that 
production function looks like five times five times L, which is 25 L. So now essentially my production, my total cost function is 50,000 plus 2200Q. My total cost function is 50,000 plus 2200Q. So what is the average cost going to equal? You're just going to divide it by Q. So now it's going to be 50,000 divided by Q plus 2200 would be my average cost. What's my marginal cost? It's 2200 because it's that's the nature of the uh, total cost function. Yeah, I'm actually solving this more than I thought I would. Um, uh, let's see here. So, um, I'll solve part B, but I won't solve part C. That will um, make me feel like you're still a little bit um, challenged, at least to think through C, maybe a little bit. Okay, how, for part B, how many teams are required to make 250 engines? So for that, go back to, remember the, um, as we started out this problem, where it equaled L equals Q over 25? Because we need to know how many laborers we need. We already know the machines, it's five. But we need to know, um, we need to know how many workers we're gonna have. So, um, that's going to equal L equals 250 over 25 because we have 250 engines is what we're trying to solve for. 250 over 25 is 10. So we're going to have 10, um, we're going to have 10 workers. Um, if we have 10, um, if we have 10 workers, that would mean that each machine, each of the five machines, get two workers. So that would be five teams. Because five teams, they'd each have one machine, and they'd each have two workers. So um, that should give you the first part of this. What's the average cost per engine? Well, that would be going back to what you solved for in part A. The total cost would be, again, 50,000 plus 2,200Q. The Q is 250, so it would essentially be 50,000 plus 2,200 times 250, and divide that by 250 and solve for it. And then finally, in letter C. Again, I want you to solve this one, but you're going to need to find the MPL, you're going to need to find the MPK, and set that ratio equal to the um, ratio of the wage rate 5,000 over the rental rate 10,000, which is essentially one half. And you're basically going to tell me, is this, how would you know if it's minimizing its total cost is when you can find whether the MPL over MPK is equal to the wage rate over the rental rate. Okay, uh, that's ending it on a bad note because you might be still a little bit confused, but you might watch it again, this that last part of the video and try to struggle with Part C a little bit. I just want you to struggle a little bit on this problem set, so work for it a little bit. Okay, I hope that helps. Again, my apologies for not having a pen to do this with.